Hello everyone, this is Carlos Garrido from Tuesquina Filosofica, and what we're going to be doing today is beginning a series of four parts on Rosalind Wallach Bolo's Dialectical Phenomenology, The Method of Marx. I'm hoping to have each part uh, have two chapters of the text included in them, so that on the fourth and final part we would have covered the eight chapters that are present in the text. Uh, this is a text that was uh, published in 1979 and uh, does something that's that's pretty unique, which is uh, take a, a phenomenological approach at uh, at Marxism. So what it's it's doing is essentially um, looking through a phenomenological lens or what she calls dialectical phenomenology, looking at the grounds of how it is that Marx uh, developed his, his work. And the work that she is looking at specifically in this text is a work called the Grandries. The Grandries are a series of manuscripts which Marx writes in 1857. It's the first time that he attempts to write what eventually becomes known as Das Kapital, or Capital Volume 1, in 1867. Um, so this is 10 years before he eventually writes uh, Capital. And in, in the Grandries, uh, the Grandries ends up being published in English for the first time fully in 1973. And uh, Bolo writes this text in 79, so it's <clears throat> It's a few years after the publishing of, of the Grandries in English, uh, at least its full version. So it's engaging with arguments that are pertinent uh, to, to the epoch and that are still pretty pertinent today. So the importance of the Grandries, which are these manuscripts that he writes in 57, are that they hold a nice sort of midpoint from the marks of the manuscripts, the, philosoph the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 44, and the Marks of Capital, Volume 1. Um, and this midpoint is seen in the fact that this text is still engaging with similar philosophical themes as he was in the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 44, but it also has a the seeds, really, or, or not just the seeds, it has already a very profoundly developed uh, scientific rigor in the study of the process of, of the capitalist uh, production, um, as we as we see later on, ten years after when he publishes Capital Volume One, so it's a nice midpoint text. Um, and in this text, which is a nine eight eight to nine hundred page animal, um, what many folks have tried to do is decipher the method that Marx uses to achieve his conclusions from, from these manuscripts. Um, it is also important to know that Marx doesn't just jump from the Grandries or the manuscripts of 57 uh, to capital. Um, in between them, he writes a text called The Contributions to the Critique of Political Economy, which is shorter than the Grandries, but is still three to 400 pages, um, in which he is continuously dealing with similar problems as he was in the Grandries. And capital is really just the third development of these two, in Spanish they call them borradores, but these two um, attempts at writing capital. They're quite influential in the eventual um, publishing, publishing of, of Das Capital. Um, so what this, what this text is attempting to do, and we shall uh, detail it further uh, later on, is a an approach that grounds Marx in what she calls the form of life out of which he arose. So she's going to end up stating that Marx Marx's method does this to his time, and that her study is in essence a reflexivity of that which Marx did. So um, thinking of it in the phenomenological tradition, it is a reflection of a reflection. The reflection, the first reflection is in Marx's 
uh, analysis of capitalist production, and now she is analyzing Marx's analysis, or in essence, Marx's method of analysis. So uh, let's get into it. The first chapter is called From a Reading of Marx to Dialectical Phenomenology. So she begins by outlining what is her conception of the relationship between subject and object. Because it is from this foundational relationship or this interpretation of a relationship that the differences in method and in conclusions and in world outlooks stem. So we're going to see that she is basing her project as the negation, as a complete opposition to a positivistic world outlook, or what could be called in the Marxist tradition, a metaphysical world outlook or a bourgeois world outlook. Um, the terms are used pretty broadly, but that's, that's what is essentially used. Um, so in the relationship between subject and object, She's not looking at subject and object as two distinct entities, um, one determining the other, uh, subject determining object, or object determining subject. Uh, rather, she's looking at both of them as functions within a totality, that the subject can only exist as subject in its relationship to objects, to the objective world around them, and the objects can only be known, their qualities can only be known in, through the meaningful relationship they hold with subjects. So, um, this is something that she takes from Lukács. So, Lukács says that in the, in the theory of reflection, we find the theoretical embodiment of the duality of thought and existence, consciousness and reality, that is so intractable to the reified consciousness. And from that point of view, it is immaterial whether things are to be regarded as reflections of concepts, or whether concepts are reflections of things. In both cases, the duality is established. So, what we have here is a duality that the West is essential for having. Separating, we see it in, in uh, uh, Les Cogitans, Les Extensa, the separation of mind and body. The problem of dualism is a problem that is here still pertinent. Um, and it is conceived of as the problem between subject and object, and we'll see it also translated between the problem of the proletariat and, and the commodity, of, of the worker and the commodity. So, the way she's looking at it is a way in which both are united, she says, rather both are united in a process. An active relationship of subject to object. This relationship may be understood as production in the sense of a subject's appropriation of an object, the incorporation of an object into the life of intentional activities of a subject. This is on page six. So she's analyzing the relationship of subject to object in a dialectical manner. They're both playing functions within a given totality. And what is that totality? Well, she calls that totality a form of life. A form of life. And she gives a good analogy of a game. She says, a game is like a form of life. And this is, of course, this analogy is one that refers back to, to Wittgenstein, but she's using it in her own manner. But the game is a form of life. It is a given totality that has its rules, right, that are agreed upon by the subjects. But the game, the way it's played, is that it necessitates subjects, which are the players, and objects, which are the equipment the players use to play the game. So what we have here is a relationship where subjects and objects are not two distinct different things existing each externally uh, and, and separate from the other, but there are two functions that play an internal and unified role in the process of a totality. That's how change comes about, in the relationship of subject to object. So, um, what, what we have then is the realization that 
in the same way as a game is a historical reality that is the result of a social um, interaction between subjects, a form of life is the same thing, right? So when baseball comes about, baseball is a result of a social interaction between people. Basketball is a result of a social interaction between people. It always arises in a historical context, and it has, uh, if you want to think of things through the categories of dialectics, there is a process of quantitative accumulation that leads to the qualitative leap of that new form of life, of that new game. Okay, So in this uh, relationship, of, of subject and object in the game or in the form of life, we have different outlooks at seeing this world. And one of the outlooks is the positivistic outlook, which is the dominant outlook in capitalism, or at least she states. And what this positivistic outlook does is conceive of things in a reified manner. So it looks at the game and doesn't realize that the game is a reality that became real because of its historical development in a, in social through social relationships. Rather, it sees the game as, as being the way that it is. It has always been that way. It is a universal game, right? So it, it is an ahistorical analysis of both the form of life and of the contents within that form of life, which it reifies as well. So of the subjects and of the objects and the classical uh, example of this is in in the commodity, which is that famous last section from chapter one of volume one of Marx's Capital. Um, she gets to this later on, but um, so she is posing her project as diametrically opposed, as the antithesis, as the negation of positivism, which she sees as this world outlook. Um, as this capitalistic world outlook. Now, what she is describing in the classical Marxist tradition is called a metaphysic world outlook as opposed to a dialectical world outlook. So whether we want to think about it as a metaphysical world outlook, which is the traditional way in which uh, the Marxist, Marx, Engels, Lenin, which is the way in which they think about it, um, or whether we want to think about it in, as a positivist world outlook. She also talks about a concrete world outlook. Um, the point is that we have a way of looking at the world that sees the world ahistorically. It doesn't see the world as a historical development of social relationships between subjects and the relationships uh, between each other and between objects and between the rules of the form of life which they themselves create and which uh, create them, right? It's a back and forth relationship. Um, but they see things as just reified standing on their own and, and, um, and in that manner. But it's not just positivism that she is attacking. She's also attacking subjectivist phenomenology. So here we can have uh, the example of Husserl or, or Schiller. Um, so she says that uh, Instead of this subjective version of phenomenology, the analysis that follows derives from a tradition that stresses a reciprocal relationship of subject and object, which I call dialectical phenomenology. The latter approach rejects the subjectivistic and objectivistic versions of the theory of reflection, the view that objects reflect their subjective meanings or mental concepts, and the view that subjective meaning or mental concepts reflect uh, the reality of objects, right? So in this first example, that objects reflect uh, their meaning onto the subject and the mental concepts, that is uh, the, the world view of Scheler. Scheler sees the world view as uh, the world and objects as having inherent value, and we come into contact with these values and discover them in our interaction with them. This isn't the approach that she's taking. She's also not taking the approach that sees the mind as the one that attributes value to the object. She is transcending this relationship, this either or, um, into what she calls the dialectical phenomenology. So um, she sees this relationship uh, in another very interesting manner, which is through 
through the Freudian sense of looking at the fetish. So I'm going to read a passage now from, from page 7. Um, she says that because of the separation of subject from object, object in capitalism, the subject, labor, appears as an independent thing separate from its object, which takes the form of the commodity, gold or money. So this is, you know, that last section of chapter one of Capital. Um, the object appears not as socially produced human wealth, but as a separate natural thing that has value in itself, a thing without grounds. Marx refers to this appearance and treatment of objects as the fetishism of commodities. Um, so this is, again, that final part of, of chapter one. But it gets interesting when she compares it to Freud's work. So she says in the same page, Marx's notion of fetish fetishism may help us better understand Freud's work. According to Freud, the meaning of salience, the meaning or salience of an object resides in the subject's relationship to the object. A fetish develops when the subject becomes divided. This means that the subject becomes two minds, possessed of opposing tendencies towards the object. Given the internal conflict, the, object deni the subject denies or represses one side of itself, or the object may appear as a divided object, such that in one aspect the object attracts, while in the other aspects it repels. So, this is a relationship of the bodily symptom and the fetish. She states, this repressed subject may represent itself as a bodily symptom, or a repressed object may represent itself as a fetish. Which form it takes, bodily symptom or fetish, may depend on which aspect of the relationship is denied more strongly. So, um, there is quite a bit of pertinence to this relationship of repression and the effects it has either on the subject or in how the subject views the object. Thus, what we see is that capitalism is a dualistic and unself-conscious form of life. She states, capitalism, an unself-conscious form of life, represses unity by separating subject from object. This separation entails a divided object, the exchange value and the use value of the commodity form, which in turn presupposes a divided subject, proletariat and bourgeoisie. A divided objectivity represents itself as a fetish, an object whose value seems to be independent of a subject. A divided subjectivity represents itself as an internal conflict, the class struggle. And thus we have constant conflict within this form of life because it is inherently dualistic and it is dualistic in a contradictory manner and thus we have the concrete experience of ourselves as free but yet determined as things at the same time uh, so we are free as human beings but yet in our relationship to work we are commodities, we are things, we are reified, we are alienated, right? Um, so it is an inherently dualistic and unself-conscious form of life. And thus the solution that she plans is socialism. But socialism here is interpreted as the process by which we become conscious of our life. So what we have here is a little bit of the younger Marx, right? The younger Marx that sees socialism as the ability to have consciousness uh, in and for itself, human consciousness be in and for itself, which is a, a sort of category, a, a, a concept that, that is really uh, in Hegel, right? Um, the concept of self-consciousness as being consciousness that is in and for itself. And this is what she uh, sustains is, is socialism. It is creating the material conditions um, by which we can look at the world in a way in which it is truly uh, a manner of looking at the world in and for itself, in a way in which we are conscious of the relationships of the world. Um, and, and this is quite simple. This would entail being conscious of the fact that the existing relationships 
are historical relationships or a historical development. They, they, things haven't been like this forever, right? Um, and with this is also recognizing that the way things arise is not as, as things that have already been there, right? Uh, the marketplace and the things being bought and sold in the marketplace are not just things. They are the results of, of, of labor. And in, in capitalism, that is social labor. It is social interactions which produce those things, social interactions which distribute them, social interactions which serve them to us for us to consume. So the whole process of capitalist production, the whole capitalist form of life, uh, the capitalist totality, is a totality that is sustained by real, concrete social relationships between people, just like every other form of life. But capitalism, uh, capitalism forgets that. And in that process of forgetting, what it does is that it reifies and it fetishizes uh, the things that are produced by social subjects while forgetting the, the social beings that made those things. And thus, the process of socialism, the consciousness involved in socialism, is a consciousness uh, that is aware of this. It is self-consciousness in and for itself. In speaking of the role of dialectical phenomenology, she states that it presupposes the empiricist mode, or the positivistic mode, as its other, that which it negates but which it requires as a condition of its own possibility. Um, and thus, one of the things that she states, and which I wish to challenge, is that dialectical phenomenology does not affirm that it exists as a negation alone. And thus she says that in page 18, it does so in order to show that its own possibility Oh, excuse me. Dialectical phenomenology is a critique, not a positive thing in itself. Its own possibility as a mode of theorizing is grounded in the dialectic of the concrete and its negation. So there's a bit of ambiguity here because she's talking about it not being a thing in itself. And that's understandable. Um, that's even assumed, uh, not just as a Kantian dingan sich, a, a thing in itself, but as a, a reified thing. Um, even if we consider it in as phenomena. But she states that it is a critique, not a positive thing. So it is a negation, not a positive thing. And I, I think this is a misunderstanding of the dialectics because every negation always affirms. And a negation that doesn't affirm always lands in the same position in which it began negating it. So, if we have a critique without an affirmation, without a positive side, what we end up affirming is subsequently what we critique in the first place. So if what she is doing is purely negational, then what she ends up falling into must be positivism. But the thing is that she sees it as pure negation, but it is itself not pure negation. In its negation, it is also an affirmation. And that was that's what has to be understood. An affirmation is not just a negation of a negation. A negation of a negation is a, a, a new affirmation, but a negation is itself an affirmation. And I, I think that she 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 mentions that, but that that is a a mistaken dialectic, uh, a, an erroneous dialectic approach. But overall, what she says that she's doing with, with Marx is something that Marx does with, with the bourgeois theorist. So what Marx does is ground the concepts and the categories of capitalism in its form of life. So it historicizes them. It places them in a historical context. It also places them in a historical context that is not just based on ideas, but a historical context that is based on relationships between subjects and relationships between subjects and objects. So what Marx does is a reflexivity of his form of life. And what she's trying to do 
with her dialectical phenomenological approach is do the same thing to Marx. So if Marx represents a reflexivity of capitalism, of grounding its materiality and its theorizing in its uh, mode of life, in its form of life, what she is doing is a reflexivity of a reflexivity. It is a double bending backwards. It is a double reflection. It is a reflection of a reflection. She is grounding Marx's grounding of, of his analysis of capitalist production. And in doing so, that's how she is going to arrive at what the method of Marx is. Going a little off the cuff, she doesn't explicitly say this, but this reflection of a reflection, if you think about it through the sort of method, me, th through the method that Husserl lays out in ideas, what she is doing is essentially bracketing the findings of Marx. She says explicitly that she's not concerned with what Marx finds. She's not concerned with empirically observing whether the findings of Marx are real. Rather, what she is concerned with is how it is that Marx achieves these conclusions. So her concern is one that is concerned with the essential structures that Marx uses to achieve the knowledge that he achieves or, or to, to arrive at his conclusions. So if we think about the structure of reflection that Husserl provides, an epoche to achieve a pure phenomenology requires the bracketing of the object of the natural attitude and the natural attitude as well. In order to then analyze the phenomenological residue that is present, and thus in order to have the essential, the eidetic structure of of that natural attitude that's concerned not with its object but rather with the structure by which we come to know the object, the intentional structure. In order to do that you need to bracket and then reflect. This is something that she states basically that Marx does. Marx uh, reflects on the mentality of his time in order to achieve at the conscious realization that the mentality is a dualistic mentality that reifies and that has unnecessary abstractions and and does you know x y and z but what she is trying to do now with marx is a reflection of the reflection so in order to analyze the method which we can conceive of the method as the essential structure by which marx is able to arrive at his conclusion in order to analyze this what she's basically doing is bracketing Marx's conclusion. She says it explicitly. She's not concerned with, with empirically verifying the stuff he says. What she's concerned with is analyzing the method. And the method is, uh, one can conceive of it as the intentional structure that Marx uh, has in his development, right? In his analysis of, of the object and his relationship to the object. So. It is a reflective process. It, it isn't pure phenomenology, but it is the process of bracketing Marx's findings in order to have the, uh, the residue of that bracketing process be the method of Marx, the essential structure by which Marx is able to discover his findings. Bolo, uh, towards the end, takes a quite controversial point, at least in relationship in, in relation to the role of the dialectics in Marxism. And she takes this, this point from Postone and uh, Reinick, uh, who state that uh, as a positive science, and this is a quote, is found on page 27, as a positive science, it would no longer be capable of understanding itself. And this is in reference to the dialectics. This is the case with every form of transhistorical dialectic whether inclusive of nature in Engels or not in Lukács. 
In either case, dialectics must be grounded ontologically, the one in being in general and the other in social being. However, that reality and or social relation in general are essentially contradictory, can only be assumed, uh, not explained. Dialectics as a trans-historical totalizing category can only be dogmatically posited at the cost of its own self-reflexive understanding. So this is an argument that, that she ends up accepting and the kernel of this argument is that dialectics is only applicable now. Dialectics is not a universal principle and this goes uh, right against some of the classical uh, Marxist positions. So we have Engels and anti during uh, I believe, although it might be in one of the essays in Dialectics of Nature, who says that nature is the test of the dialectics. That in, in nature and in the scientific discoveries that we make about how nature functions, we have the proof of the laws of the dialectics. And in, in, in the Dialectics of Nature, he does a nice three, uh, a three law uh, takedown of what of the uh, of the essential laws of the dialectics and he goes on to demonstrate how nature proves these things and thus from from uh, the realization that the logos if, if you wish of nature is structured in a dialectical manner that there's an object what he calls objective dialectic that it exists objectively um, from there you derive the universality of the dialectical method right and thus, we might be conscious of it or not, the dialectics exist in nature. Nature moves, uh, and nature is never static. Nature is always in flux. And this flux is one that is structured dialectically, right? And uh, the dialectics that we're conscious of is what he calls subjective dialectics. Um, but the point that, that she's agreeing with here, which is that dialectics has a a relativity to our context the dialectics is not universal um is one that i i think most most marxists would dispute uh dialectics was not uh something that was invented by by marx it was it was not invented by hegel um dialectics comes from as early as the greek thinkers and also the, some of the eastern thinkers we have in heraclitus a conception that we never step in the same river twice that things are always in a constant flux through the relationship of their oppositions um, this is dialectics and then in plato and in aristotle we have different instances of speaking of change in in categories that resemble those that are uh, then systematize in Hegel's dialectic. So Hegel's the first one that systematizes a dialectic, but he does it, as Marx states in the second preface to the German edition of Capital. Uh, he does it in a way in which it's on its head. Marx flips Hegel and, and puts him on his feet and thus rescues the dialectic. But uh, the conception that the dialectic is something that once the problems of our present form of life are resolved, is sort of superfluous um, I don't think many Marxists will agree with that because change is, is something that's constant in life and what we've been able to observe with science is that change takes on the structures of dialectics so uh, the basic laws of the dialectics that things go from quantity to quality that uh, the negation of the negation um, these basic laws are present in science and and anyone who picks up dialectics of nature and if it has a modern preface you'll see that almost in every modern preface you have the examples of how modern science has demonstrated uh that things work <laughs> dialectically so i don't think this point is is quite true to state that the dialectics is not a trans uh historical universal um because that that point itself would have to be an abstraction. It would have to state that um, the way that the laws of the planet work now uh, don't doesn't mean that it has always worked in this manner. So we have that sort of weird connection problem that we see in Hume. That just because something works this way now doesn't mean that it, it has always worked or that it's going to continue to work in the future. So I think that for those who accept the thesis of, of, of science um, 
and, and who see that dialectical principles are always in, in, in present in, in scientific discoveries, this comment of the relativity of the dialectic is something that, that must be tossed aside. The final important point that she makes is regarding the laws of Marx's form of life, right? So remember that we gave the game analogy at the beginning, that she gave the game analogy at the beginning, and every game has its rules, its laws. So what she is doing is interpreting what the laws are for the method that Marx uses, for the game that he's playing, the game in which he's grounded in. So she states that there's four of them. I'm going to read the four now. This is on page 30 and 31 for those who have the text. One, recognize and treat concepts as grounded in a historically specific form of life. This is the principle of analysis. So basically concepts are not just universal concepts. Concepts arise out of a historical specificity and out of social relations. Two, recognize and treat individuals as grounded in a historically specific form of life. Individuals both reproductive and, and produced and limited by the totality uh, of which they are a part. This is the principle of action, right? So the same thing with the concept, but with individuals. They are historical reality, one which is influenced and which influences the totality of which they are a part of. Um, three, recognize and treat a form of life as a totality of internal relations, that which enables one to see phenomena as internally related, that which makes them into a self-moving being or a totality. This is the principle of subjectivity. So in Hegelian jargon, this is the principle of, of quality know how to uh, know how to analyze what is the quality here um, what is the the essential structure that is that is at play what is the what she calls the subjectivity that is at play it's all different words but what they refer to as a given totality and if you think about things dialectically this is a totality that necessarily arises because of the previous totalities quantitative accumulations determining that leap towards the present totality, the present form of life that we're analyzing. And lastly, four, recognize and treat a concrete form of life as contradictory. Concrete here is taken in the positivistic sense as opposed to analytic, which is the phenomenological and dialectical uh, manner in which she's interpreting things. So, uh, recognize and treat concrete form of life as contradictory. The contradictions are embodied in internal structures of opposition. This is the principle of growth and hence change. So, again, as I mentioned, we, it goes back to Heraclitus. Where does change come from? Well, it comes from the oppositions and contradictions be between, between things. So, those are the, fa for the four, which she considers to be the four uh, major laws, the four major uh, rules grounding uh, Marx's work and Marx's theorizing of uh, the capitalist uh, mode of production, the capitalist totality. The second chapter we're going to be looking at is called From Dialectical Phenomenology to a Rereading of Marx. And this chapter deals with the four rules that were mentioned at the end of chapter one. So uh, the first rule, given that it's the principle of analysis, as stated, is the one that's going to get the most attention. One of the things that is emphasized is that the first two rules are the phenomenological rules, and the last two rules are the dialectical rules. We then begin by looking at where is it that we start? And by this I mean, where is it that Marx starts his grandresis? So, does he start with concepts? Does he start with the concrete, the thing there? No. Uh, Marx takes what uh, Bolo calls a phenomenological approach to this, or what in earlier texts from Marx one can see as a inherently unique form of materialism, a humanistic materialist approach. And this approach is one that does not start the analysis 
from the thing that's there but realizes that before the thing is there there are things that presuppose it there are certain sets of relationships that presuppose it that you cannot understand the thing there unless you understand those things that presuppose it so mark states in page 100 of the urban trees that the population is an abstraction i leave that if i leave out for example the classes uh, which it is composed so many bourgeois economists start with the population if he starts with the population it is an abstraction if he leaves out the classes but those classes themselves he states are empty phrases if i am not familiar with the elements on which they rest wage labor capital etc these later then in turn presuppose exchange division of labor prices etc so the method here is one that is trying to get at the pith at the central thing the first thing that one can look at i don't want to use the term first cause because we know what that entails but it really is trying to look at the most fundamental starting point the most fundamental cause and build itself from there so in a way it is a cartesian method if we remember from descartes discourse on method what he's trying to do is get at the simplest thing that he can know without a doubt and then build from that in a strangely similar manner this is the same process which marx is doing here he is trying to get at the thing which presupposes the least amount of things or which presupposes uh, nothing at all so he's looking for what is the right starting point and, and this is one of the things that he continues to do because if we see what he starts uh, the Grand Rises with and what he starts capital with you know he famously starts capital with his analysis of the commodities but what we see in the Grand Rises is that he starts with money so uh, he ends up seeing the commodity as as preceding money but there's a constant search for looking at what is that first thing out of which everything else begins to build Marx sees this first thing this most concrete thing as as relations um, and these relations become understandable through concepts and thus he states that relations can be expressed of course only in ideas and again the abstraction or idea however is nothing more than the theoretical expression of those material relations and relations can be established as existing only by being thought thus she states the concrete is composed of relations and not independent individuals relations however can only be apprehended theoretically through concepts therefore an analysis of the concrete must proceed as an analysis of the concepts now this might seem contradictory to the folks who have read the german ideology and who are familiar uh, with the marxist thesis uh, that you start from the concrete and then you move to the realm of ideas but i think we have to understand what is concretely stated here What's stated here is not uh, to use the jargon from the German ideology that we're going to start from the realm of the heavens to go to the realm of, of earth, right? Remember Marx says, our philosophy starts from earth and goes then, then is able to go to, to the heavens. So concrete starts from concrete real men and then is able to analyze the ideas that men have and the ideas that men have about themselves. Um, and it might seem to to the eye that what she is saying here is contradicting this because what what is essentially being stated is that an analysis of concepts must come before an analysis of the concrete 
But we have to think of this dialectically. And the concepts themselves only arise thanks to the concrete. Only because of the concrete material relations do the concepts arrive, arise. So that's the point that has been made from the beginning of, of, of Marxist uh, theorizations, or at least since the German ideology. The point that is being made here is the one that comes after that. In order to truly analyze the material then, you have to do it through concepts. If you don't have concepts, then what are you analyzing? There's nothing you can analyze. And thus, you, you have that realization that from the concrete, the concept arises. But in order to then go back to the... In order to understand the concrete, you have to do it through the concepts that arise from the concrete. And use those concepts to go back to the concrete and examine the concrete with them. So, it's a dialectical relationship that goes from the concrete to the conceptual to the concrete again. Um, for folks interested in this, a uh, person that systemizes it quite nicely uh, is actually Mao Zedong in his essay called On Practice. And there he lays out what, it, what can be considered as a, a sort of Marxist epistemology where he develops the process of how we come to know. And in that process, he formulates the same relationship of from the concrete to the conceptual, and then from the conceptual to the concrete again. Perhaps the central point in this first law, which is conceived of as the principle of analysis, is the fact that even the most abstract and universally seeming categories are only that because of the historical specificity out of which they arose. Everything, regardless of how abstract its character might seem, arises out of a given historical specificity. So, he states in, in the Grandris that even the most abstract categories, despite their validity, precisely because of their abstractness, are, in the specific character of this abstraction, themselves a product of historical relations, and possess their full validity only for and within these relationships. So you can have a totalizing universal truth within one totality. And the truth of that might stay in part in future totalities. But as a totalizing truth, it is specific to its specific totality. So it can have elements of universality that are sustained throughout different epochs. But in its specific epoch or in its specific totality, if it's considered a f fully universal truth, it is only a fully universal truth within that specific totality. So it could, you could even say that it is a relative universal. It is a universal that is a particular universal to this relative context. Of course, to say that a category is something that is produced by a form of life does not mean uh, merely that it first appeared in this form of life or totality, epoch, whatever. Rather, what it means is that only in the series of relationships within, in the series of relations within this form of life did this category appear and not just appear but appear as a certain truth and thus in the last video that I made uh, which examined the concept of justice in the tradition of Western political philosophy the point that I was making is that the concept of justice in, in Plato, Locke and, and all the others stems from their specific epoch, or to use the jargon that Bolo uses, from their specific form of life. And not just from their specific form of life, but from their specific position within that form of life. So, this does not mean that Plato's theory of justice, to say that Plato's theory of justice is produced by his epoch, doesn't mean that it originates in his epoch. But rather, that it is 
it, it, it comes from a specific set of relationships and not just a specific uh, totality that has a specific set of relationships internally, but his specific placement his specific grouping within those sets of relationships, which is to say his specific class within a given epoch, right? So it is not just that to say that something comes from a form of life, it doesn't just mean that it, it is uh, first seen in that form of life, but rather that in the relationships, in the relations internal to that form of life is somehow how this thing, how this category arises as a sort of truth. She goes on to develop nine points that really summarize what the principle of analysis, that first rule, stands for. First, the concrete is a totality of relations. Second, relations are concepts. Third, the concrete is, therefore, a totality of concepts. Fourth, concepts do not originate in consciousness. They presuppose a subject and its object. Five. A relation of subject and object is a production. Six, the concrete is a totality of a production, a form of life. Seven, there are different modes of production, hence different forms of life. Eight, the categories are historically specific to their mode of production. And nine, analysis reformulates objects of knowledge in terms of the historically specific mode of production that makes them possible. Now, why is it important? to conceive of history as production, as a specific relation, uh, as, as a succession of different totalities, different forms of life that have specific uh, relations of subject to object and, and different rules governing them. Well, for the simple fact that it is in this distinction that the historical from the ahistorical conceptions and analysis of phenomena arise. Take, for example, capital. If one interprets capital as objectified labor, what happens is that capital ends up becoming a general eternal relationship of nature, which means capital ends up becoming something universal. If you're not able to distinguish what the essential differences are in the epochs, you end up abstracting the specific thing you're talking about into a universality and considering it as something that belongs in every totality. Now that's not to say that there aren't concepts which do accurately represent something that is trans a form of life, beyond a specific form of life. For example, production in general. If we want to avoid repetition of speaking of, of mentioning what we're speaking about every time we speak of a form of life's production, we say production in general, right? But the problem comes, as I stated, when we forget to realize that there's a specific historical context and treat things that are from a specific historical context as Universal, and these are things that have a a concrete um, a concrete importance. For example, uh, capitalism presents the state as something that is universal, something that has always existed in civilization, at least. And it takes uh, different studies, like the works that Marx and Engels did in the mid-40s, um, but concretely studies like uh, Lewis Henry Morgan's Ancient Societies, which demonstrate that, no, the state wasn't always uh, a thing. The state didn't always exist. So what that does is get a concept that had previously been abstracted from its historical specificity and universalized. What it does is negate that and brings it into its historical specificity. It brings it into its form of life and realize, it realizes that uh, in this case of the state, the state is something that belongs to these specific forms of life. It's, it, it's um, again, one of those things that is not just from one form of life. The capitalist form of life has the capitalist state. 
and the, the feudal form of life has the feudal state, right? So when you speak of state in general, is something that is beyond one form of life, but is not uh, expressive in all forms of life, only in a specific uh, two, three, four different forms of life. So um, it is important to understand the relationship of when it is that something uh, goes beyond its form of life in a fair way. So in the, the concept of production in general, that's, that's a fair way of going beyond a specific form of life. But when one speaks of capital uh, in a way in which it goes beyond a form of life, if one speaks of capital just as objectified labor, as the, the result of labor is already capital, that ignores the essential uh, qualities that are in the form of life in which capital uh, de facto arises. It is also important to see that this process by which we abstract something that is specific to a form of life into a reality that is universal, it is important to see that process not as a cognitive mistake, right? There's uh, an intentional structure behind that. And I don't mean intentional here in the phenomenological sense, but there's there's a motive behind that, an interest, because in, in doing that, in, for example, in placing capital as a universal, what you're doing is eternalizing a specific set of relationships which belong to one epoch. And thus, if, for example, if you're if you place yourself in the position of a revolutionary and what you think you're facing is something that is eternal, uh, that is, is something that you can't face, you know? If you think something is eternal, uh, that it has never not been, how do you face that? You, you can't, right? So it is in realizing that considering things through the historical specificity out of which they arise, um, when you come to this realization, this is a powerful realization and because it has the potential for revolution in it. If you realize that capital as the guiding force in the form of life in which we are presently in and, and have been for the last uh, few centuries, um, if you realize that this is not a universal relationship. This is not a natural relationship, but rather a specific social one to a specific context. Um, then you know it's changeable. You know it's changeable, and you know that in the same way in which it wasn't at some point in the past, it probably won't be at some point in in the future. And so he states uh, the aim, and this is in the Grandis again, page eighty-seven. The aim is rather to present production as distinct from distribution. And this is something the capitalists do. You don't see uh, the capitalist or the bourgeois theorist talking about the universality of how distribution is done. Like, they're able to see distribution is specifically done uh, in this specific way out of in, in our specific form of life, right? But they don't do the same with production. Production remains as a universal. And this is quite important and an important lesson for uh, those of us on on the revolutionary left today, uh, because it, it's it's an insight that lets us know uh, from how the bourgeois theorists think about the process of production itself. It lets us know what the real pressure points are in society, and the pressure points have remained the same from the time of Marx. The pressure points are the productive sphere, not the distributive, and not the the service industry, which explodes after World War II, but the pressure points have maintained their position. And we see this in how the bourgeois theorist uh, makes this process of abstraction, which might be seen as a cognitive mistake, but it has, uh, it has a, an, an interest behind it. If, it's, if we see that the, the bourgeois theorist is constantly positing the productive process as something that is universal, 
but yet he is okay with seeing distribution and 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 the uh, the sphere of consumption as things that are specific to this form of life that must give us an insight in which one of those three spheres has the most power which one of those three spheres holds the most the the, the heart which one of the three is is the heart of capitalist society and although there's workers in all three parts if we're not organizing with the workers that are in that productive sphere the one that the bourgeois theorists uh, feels the need to universalize to make eternal so that we feel hopeless and changing if we're not organizing those workers we're not doing anything to substantially change the form of life we're in so it is important to see even when we're in in such technical works how the practicality of it is 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 still pertinent so if we if we don't conceive of uh, things that arise arising out of a specific form of life out of a specific historical context if we accept the narratives that what is now has always been um, we we are essentially futile to substantial change substantial change always precedes an awareness that the possibility of change is a possibility and thus uh, even here in the most technical of, of works one can see how the implications of practice are present I think below summarizes this nicely in the following quote this is on page 42 for those of you that are following along with the book uh, states Marx suggests that they do this in order to indicate the possibility of human intervention in the distribution of wealth but not in its production. So if we think of how the, the left has acted in, in the U.S., what is it that they seek change in? Do they seek change in the way things are produced or in the way things are distributed in the level post-production? So again, here, look at the pertinence uh, in our material reality. So it says, by implying that capital is a natural, eternal relation of production and that bourgeois relations of production based on capital are therefore independent of history, they can lead attention to distribution and away from production because they do not conceive of production as a history that includes distribution they conceive of distribution only as problematic uh, and that which is subject to intervention and thus we can tax the rich we can have welfare we can do all of these things we can have a ubi but what we cannot do what we cannot allow people to do is change the structure of how things are produced why because that is what the bourgeois theorist cares about that is what sustains the form of life at least in its essence and thus in realizing this we're able to realize what it is that we have to attack if we want a substantial change in the form of life we're not going to get a substantial change in the form of life by manipulating how wealth is distributed we need to realize that before distribution is production and if we really want the change in the power structures of our society if we want to change in the form of life one that feels substantial we have to change how that level of production that precedes distribution and precedes consumption how that level functions to say that one needs to analyze things as historical specificities or as specific to one form of life doesn't mean that you need to understand chronologically either the forms of life that came before that or or how that thing might appear in different forms of life before. Rather, what it means is that you need to be able to understand what the presuppositions are behind the relationships which are taking place in the present uh, form of life. When you look at history in this manner, you're able to look at the past, something you do only after you understand the present, as a process of becoming towards where the present is at the moment this is something again the bourgeois theorist he states fails to do and thus he states in page 460 of the grand Dries, that is individual capitals can continue to arise by means of hoarding but the hoarding is transformed into capital only by means of the exploitation of labor the bourgeois economists who regard capital as an external and natural and not historical form of production then attempt at the same time to legitimize it again by formulating the conditions of its becoming as the conditions of its contemporary realization, presenting the moments in which the capitalist still appropriates, not as a capitalist, because he is still becoming, 
as the very condition in which he appropriates as a capitalist. So um, what the bourgeois theorist does is take the conditions of becoming of the capitalist in which he is just hoarding money, which is a condition in which his hoarding is still not capital yet, and he interprets that as being, and thus he interprets becoming as being, and he ends up being unable to fully understand being because he also doesn't understand being's becoming because he understands it's becoming as being already. Part of the importance of being able to think of the past as becoming is because it helps you think of the present as the becoming of the future, of the becoming of the future being. Because if not, it's very easy to fall into the reverse of what the bourgeois theorist is doing. Uh, whereas we think of the present and the future as equally being, instead of the present, the present's relationship to the future as one of becoming. So to use uh, phenomenological jargon, uh, with Husserl we have the two concepts of retention and protension. So if we're able to understand, to retain, uh, to have a conception of the past that sees the past as becoming, our protension, what we expect for the future, is related to our ability to conceive of the present as the becoming of the being of the future. The second rule says to treat individuals as grounded in a historically specific form of life. What this means is simple. Don't conceive of individuals as actions just as a result of their decisions, intentions, or characteristics which is what psychologism does. Rather, conceive of their decisions, intentions, and characteristics as the results uh, of their form of life. And thus, what, what this helps one do is ground things like language, not in the individual, but in the form of life, in the social relations, that are in the internal structure of the form of life. So uh, Borleau starts to draw a lot of similarities between what Marx is doing here and what the analytic tradition of Wittgenstein uh, does, uh, specifically the latter Wittgenstein concerned with language games and, and uh, and his, the concept of form of life is itself a concept of his. So, um, for example, uh, she states that uh, there is no possibility of language that is the product of a single isolated individual. This is something that is in the analytic tradition and is something that, that is in Marx as well. And thus Marx states, in uh, page 84 of the Grandrice, that production by an isolated individual outside of society is as much of an absurdity as the development of language without individuals living together and talking to each other, right? Um, this argument is, is one that he uses uh, not just against uh, uh, Smith and Ricardo's Robinson Crusoe, but against uh, uh, Proulx. So if we remember... Um, that, that text that Marx does, uh, I believe this either 1847, uh, The Poverty of Philosophy, which is a response to Proulx's The Philosophy of Poverty. But in, in The Philosophy of Poverty, Proulx begins uh, from the individual. Trade starts from the individual, right? And, and what Marx argues is that there needs to be a division of labor in order for trade to even come about, because trade is the result of a surplus, and that surplus is the result of a division of labor. So, in the same way that language cannot be developed, in, we, we can in, inverse the quote itself, in the same way that language cannot uh, be developed without a community, uh, the relationships of production cannot be developed uh, without a community either, right? So, and, and trade and, and uh, and a market cannot exist without um, a community. There is no individual that, you know, is the sole agent in the process of production. It requires a community. It isn't just the fact that when one sees 
the individual as the source of production or the source of language, right? It isn't just the fact that it is not true that the community is required for production and for language, but even in the conception of the individual in the first place, you have already a misconception because the individual is itself only a product of the community, only a product of the of the society. Um, unless we, we want to use the, the Shaler distinction of community and society, but the individual is itself a product of the group. And thus, Mark states in page 84 of the Grundrisse that the human being is an, animal, is an animal which can individuate itself only in the midst of society. Then he states in 265 of the same text, society does not consist of individuals, but expresses the sum of interrelations, the relations within which these individuals stand. But let us not forget where these conceptions of the individual arise. They don't come from a void. They are very specific to a form of life and even more specific to a form of life that is beginning to develop. So Marx says, uh, page 83 of the Grandrice, the 18th century individual is the product on the one side of the dissolution of the feudal forms of society and on the other side of the new forces of production developed since the 16th century. So quite literally, this uh, foundation of society, this kernel of society as the individual, is something that is the result of the changes in relations that are taking place in, uh, in, in the process of a quantitative leap towards a, what the author below would call a new form of life, or towards a new totality, towards a new epoch, right? So it is, in essence, the development of capitalism, which leads to the possibility then of these theorists to base themselves purely on the individual. It is in these uncoverings that we see Marx's method, his, his phenomenological approach, because Marx is not simply saying that these 18th century theorists, that Ricardo, that Smith, that Rousseau, that Prujon, uh, Prujon, of course, 19th century, but he's not just saying that they're wrong, right? He's explaining how they got to their conclusions. And in order to do that, he needs, he, he, he demonstrates how what they're doing is a projection of the concrete individual of the time. So it is the form of life, the relationships that are internal to that form of life and the, the development of early capitalism, which lead to the possibility of thinking of a singular human being, not as a, a integral connected part to a whole, but as an individual. And thus what he does, this is a reflective phenomenological process that, that he's doing, that it, it helps, it, it essentially grounds how it is that these people come to these conclusions. It doesn't just argue that they're wrong, right? It, it does so, but peripherically. The central aim is to demonstrate how it is that these people are getting to these conclusions. And the wrongness, the essential wrongness, is in the fact that these people get to these conclusions and they believe these conclusions to be natural. They believe that nature is in such a way as, as, uh, as which, uh, that nature is in such a way that the individual is the kernel of society, that from the individual stems everything. And they universalize something that comes from a specific form of life. And thus that, that's where the, the, the central error is. But Marx is not just trying to prove that they're wrong, but showing how it is that they got to their conception. And in doing so, he's Im implying their wrongness because their approach is one that claims universality, but which in reality is quite particular. Alrighty, so we are in the third rule now. And the third rule is to treat a form of life as a totality of internal relations. So remember, when we started chapter 2, I mentioned that the first two rules were going to be the phenomenological rules. We just finished those. Now we're approaching the dialectical rules in Marx. It's going to get a little sticky from here on. I... I do think that it starts to get a bit more complex, but I'm going to try my best to sort of chew it down and present simple examples that are able to uh, help you guys see how this, which looks quite abstract and, and which has 
it makes your mind feel like it's kind of going numb when you read it once um, how when you grasp it it can be formulated in quite simple examples so um, she begins by laying out the distinctions between society and a form of life society she describes as uh, a social grouping that has boundaries and is distinguishable from other social groupings and form of life which is a concept that we've continuously used as uh, a, a specifically dialectical process of social production a process in which subject in which a subject produces itself as such in its production with objects so in a form of life we have a dialectical unity between the subject and object and this gets back to some of the fundamental things that we were talking about at the beginning in concerning the relationship of subject and object. The approach that Marx takes is uh, the approach of uh, a form of life, which is, again, the one that she's taking to analyze Marx as well. And, and again, this is an approach that looks at internal relations and not necessarily external ones. Um, and thus, one of the things that we go on to analyze is the... Th three fundamental points, uh, the three or four fundamental points uh, in the process of, of capitalist production. And those, of course, are production, consumption, distribution, and exchange. And so what Marx does is something that uh, that is going to be a bit hard to formulate because it does sound quite contradictory until we're able to to really understand it but what he does is place production as the starting point of the whole process while also stating that the process itself all of the steps if you wish to call them are united so if we if we think about it in terms of the relationship we talked about at the beginning between subject and object what we have here with these different steps in the cycle of capitalist production and reproduction is production serving as the subject. Production is the subject, and then everything else is, is the object. And they, they, uh, they make a unified whole, right? Uh, and each play a function in the dynamic of the totality of the form of life but the role as subjectivity, the role as the point of departure, or if you wish to call it the, the, the role that determines the rest, is the role of production. It is important here to understand that when one states that production determines the other, um, we're not talking about causal determination specifically. What we're talking is that the others always presuppose production. But once we start examining the relationship of consumption and, and production, um, it starts to feel like maybe it could also be consumption that uh, dominates. Um, so Marx is addressing this. So I'm, I'm going to read quite a few quotes now and, and try to explain them as I read them. So Marx states that uh, production the product becomes a real product only by being consumed. So for example, a garment becomes a real garment only in the act of being worn, the purpose of which is to put, uh, to put it on. Uh, and that is what determines the type of product it is. A house where no one lives is in fact no real house. Um, in addition, it might seem that consumption is the predominant relationship because consumption creates the need for a new production. Um, and a lot of the bourgeois theorists think in this, in this manner. It is consumption which, which uh, determines production. Um, so Marx is already anticipating this and is, is questioning himself. And I think he questions himself perhaps better than any of the actual proponents of consumption can question. Um, so Marx indicates that uh, no production without a need, but consumption reproduces the need. And thus, um, what is it that, that he's saying here? 
Well, he says three fundamental things. First, he says that uh, production uh, creates consumption because it furnishes the material and the object for consumption. So quite literally, production makes the thing that ends up being consumed. Secondly, he states, he states that production produces not only the object, but also the manner of consumption, not only objectively, but subjectively. Production thus creates the consumer. The object is not an object in general, but a specific object which must be consumed in a specific manner to be mediated in turn by its production itself. So production not only creates the product that is consumed, but it also creates the manner in which it is consumed. And in doing so, it also defines the consumer. And thus, think of people who collect something. Uh, if, if you collect guitars, the consumer is identified not as a separate type of thing as consumer, but it's identified by the productive process. And the productive process determines the means by which the consumer consumes, and it also begins to create the consumer itself. It, the, it, it, as he states, uh, production creates the consumer. And thus, here the consumer, the guitar enthusiast, is also <laughs> something that is produced by production. The consumer is created by production itself. Um, and thus, he offers a, a good example. He says that, uh, that, you know, many might say that hunger is hunger, but the hunger that is gratified by a cooked meat eaten with a knife and a fork is different than the hunger uh, that... Um, but that one has when one bolts down on a raw piece of meat with the aid of the hand, nails, and tooth. So um, there we see that the, the production it seems to determine uh, consumption as well. So uh, the third point he states is that as soon as consumption emerges from its initial state of nature, crudity, and immediacy, and if it remained at that stage, this would be because production itself had been arrested there. It is because it becomes itself mediated as a drive by the object. The need which consumption feels for the object is created by the perception of it. And today in consumerist culture, um, the desire is something that we all accept as something that is created by advertisement and, 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 and other means to create the desire. Um, in the society in which Marx was living in, there wasn't that hyper-advertisement uh, consumerist culture, but he's already seeing this. The fact that the desire itself is something that is created also by production, right? And we can consider it the production of advertisement. Um, thus, he states that uh, the need which consumption feels for the object is created by the perception of it. The perception of the object creates the need. The object of art like every other product, creates a public which is sensitive to art and enjoys beauty. Considering that the framework of the bourgeois theorist is that consumption creates production, what Marx is showing here is that uh, production creates consumption as well. So does that mean that they both create each other? Is there a balance then? Um, the answer is no. Uh, Marx ends up still favoring production as as the subject and the relationship as the point of departure. But let's look at the dialectical relationship that Marx sees between the two, because that that is one of those things that might feel like, before you hear the arguments after, it might feel like um, the relationship is one of, of uh, equality when he s continues to hold, even with these comments of the dialectic between consumption and production, production as, as the predominant one. So he says, and this is on page 93 of the Gondries. Not only is production immediately consumption and consumption immediately production, not only is production a means for consumption and consumption the aim of production, each supplies the other with its object. And then in parentheses, production supplying the external object of consumption, consumption the conceived object of production. But also, each of them, apart from being immediately the other, and apart from mediating the other, in addition to this, creates the other in completing itself and creates itself as the other. So here we have that beautiful Hegelian jargon uh, uh, um, 
you can replace a few words and what you have is the section on the sublimation of subjectivity in, in Hegel's phenomenology. But what we have here is what would seem to entail an equality of production and consumption. But that's not what Marx ends up saying. So um, he ends up saying that production is still the point of departure and hence the predominant moment. But why? The, que the question is why? Um, well, he says that the individual producers, uh, the individual produces an object and by consuming it, returns to himself, but returns as a productive and self-reproducing reproducing individual. Consumption thus appears as a moment of production. Um, this itself, and I agree with Bolo here, this seems like it, it is begging the question. So I, I think we have to flush out a bit more what is being stated here. So, as Bolo states in page 57 of the text, as soon as one talks of concrete consumption, urges uh, with a specific realizable object, production is already presupposed. Whereas consumption may be the point of departure ideally, in positing an ideal for production to realize, consumption itself is only realized as a specific type of consumption, a consumption of a specific object, by the production of those objects. Hence, a specific consumption presupposes a specific production. Production is the starting point because any intelligible activity is productive activity in that it produces and reproduces the actor as such. The human is a specific type of individual because of its activity, even as a consumer, the human is a specific type of consumer which is determined by its production. So that's the example that I gave of, of the guitar enthusiast. As a consumer, it's defined by the production which uh, allows him to consume. Overall, consumption is always consumption of a specific object. However, a specific object presupposes a specific relation to that object, a specific mode of appropriation or production. So this is the, the essence of the argument. And if we think about it, uh, if you're going to make a sandwich, yes, ideally, the reason why you make a sandwich is because you have hunger, because you have a need, right? And thus the consumption drive is the one that promotes the productive one in that case. And this is an ideal relationship. But the thing is that it is impossible to consume anything that hasn't been produced. And thus there is a material determination and not an ideal one that is happening on the other way around. And that material determination, the fact that it is quite literally impossible to consume anything that hasn't, something that hasn't been produced, is why the weight is in production. It is why production determines everything else. And remember, the determination here is not conceived as, a, as just causal determination, but presupposition. And thus, when you consume something, what is presupposed in that thing you're consuming is its production, because it's there. Now, Although when you produce, you're thinking of an ideal consumer already, that is an ideal relationship, right? That is in the realm of ideas. I can produce and, and, and be unconscious of the consumer, the, the rigidity by which the one holds the other outweighs. And that's why production is more important because whereas consumption is impossible without production, although consumption is uh, in, in a way determines production, right? You produce what, uh, what's I ideally gonna be consumed, right? And you shape the production to, to what's gonna be consumed. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. You can produce whatever you want. And what we see in today's capitalism is that you produce whatever you want and then you produce the advertisement so that the need for that thing that you're producing that you produce without any relationship at all to consumption comes about. And thus, what we see here is that the determining effect of production over consumption is a lot stronger because consumption can guide production, but production determines consumption. I think it's worthwhile getting these points and contextualizing it where current Marxism or, or current leftist socialist politics are. We have a socialism today in the US at least 
that has completely ignored, at least over the last 50 years, the, the workers in the productive sector. It has ignored manufacturing workers. It has ignored um, uh, industrial workers. And what it has focused its organizing energies on has been marginalized communities, service industry workers, and there has been an explosion of service industry jobs, right, which is fair. And no one is saying that you shouldn't organize those communities. You definitely should. But we already see here in Marx a formulation of the role that production plays. Production is the determining factor of all the other things because all of the other things necessarily presuppose something being produced. And thus, although there's workers in production, distribution, uh, uh, service, uh, so uh, service, of course, relating to consumption and um, exchange, the workers that are in right next to production, the workers that are in, in the process of production are the ones that are in the pressure point of the economy because they are the ones that are in the places where everything else is determined. And what this entails for the left and for those who actually want a new form of life is that if we are serious about wanting a new form of life, we must organize those that are at the point of departure, as Marx states, those that are in the predominant moment and that is the level of production. The left's excuse for not organizing this sector has been twofold. First, it has stated that they are opportunistic, that the comfort that the working classes in, in the West have received have made them lose their position as a revolutionary agent. This is a position that is absurd, right? Because it doesn't matter the comfort, there always exists the role of the vanguard that needs to go to the working class and ensure that they're doing more than just trade unionism, that they're fighting to emancipate, not just uh, to, 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 for actual emancipation, not just for the betterment of their short term conditions. But the second thing that these people say to ignore this, this, uh, this this, these workers in, in the sector of production is that they're bigots or that they have social views that they disagree with. And OK. That's messed up. But how are you going to change those views by ignoring them? All you're doing by ignoring them and by pushing them away is pushing them into circles that share those views. All you're doing is throwing more, more wood to the fire. You're making things worse. What you have to do when you have these circles that have bigoted and reactionary views is go to them. And since their bigoted and reactionary views come from a false consciousness of not being able to see who they're real, uh, uh, opponent is the fact that they see their opponent as an immigrant, a black person, a, a LGBTQ person. Uh, it, that's not true. And we know that's not true. So we have to be able to go to these circles and organize, uh, even if they have views that we disagree with, because that's the only way to one, change the views that we disagree with. And two, actually have a movement that can successfully produce a new form of life. Excuse me for the short uh, sideline comment, but um, he goes then uh, and does the same thing he did with consumption with distribution. And thus, he asks, can it be that distribution is what determines production? Can it be distribution the point of departure? And he states, well, when uh, land is conquered um, and then the land ends up being distributed, that seems to be what entails production. Um, but uh, this argument, he kind of destroys a lot quicker. Uh, he says, and this is page 97 of the Grand Ries, In all cases of conquest, three things are possible. The conquering people subjugate the conquered under its own mode of production, or it leaves the old mode intact and contents itself with a tribute, or a reciprocal interaction takes place whereby something new, a synthesis, arises. In all cases, the mode of production, whether that be of the conquering people, that of the conquered, or that emerging from the fusion of both, is decisive for the new distribution which arises. This is itself quite a commonsensical point. In order for something to be distributed, it needs to first be, it needs to first exist, and for that thing to exist, it needs to be produced. And thus, this, this argument gets, uh, or the counter-argument that he presents himself, gets sort of thrown out quite quickly. One can have, for example, 
a change in, in how things are distributed. You can have a higher wealth tax, you can do all sorts of things, but that doesn't fundamentally change the way things are produced. While on the other hand, if you change how things are produced, you're necessarily going to change how they are distributed. So um, it was perhaps a bit harder to see how production dominated over consumption in the previous example, but now with distribution, it, it becomes very easy to see that production uh, quite clearly dominates over over distribution. In order for something to be distributed, it has to be produced. When production changes, distribution changes, but when distribution changes alone, that doesn't entail a change in production. One can easily ask, well, what is the point here? What's the point of uh, over infatuating about which part is the most important part? Well, because when you determine which part is the most important, important part, like we mentioned, you're determining what the subject is. And in determining what the subject is, you're also determining what is it that determines all of the other things. Remember, determination here means what is it that makes all of the other things presuppose this thing. Um, and thus, the importance of locating it is in order to have a subject that goes through history. If you go through history without having a subject, it's, it's chaotic. But when you have a subject as that which is present in history, you have the ability to recognize the differences in the modes of life. You have the ability to recognize different epochs because you can relate those epochs to what the subject is and the subject is production. And thus, the different forms of production are what marks the, the different epochs. And uh, so it says here, uh, production is both the total process Right? So it en encapsulates the total process of how we define an epoch. So, and this is on page 60, uh, production is both the total process of which the others are moments, a mode of production, and a set of particular activities called production. But it is also a moment in the totality. So it's a, it's a weird sort of relationship, but production is the totality that which everything else is just a moment and it is also a moment within itself as a totality so um think about this as a coach in a softball beer league right he is the coach so he's the one that uh that's the active subject in the totality of the team but he is also a moment within that totality so he also has to coach himself <laughs> So um, it might sound a little weird to think of something as being the whole and as well one of the parts in that whole, but it makes sense, especially when we consider uh, all of the other examples in which we can conceive of the whole being defined by one thing and then uh, that one thing which defines the whole being itself a particular moment within the totality. With this formulation, of production interpreted as a mode of production, a totality and also a moment within itself. We can now analyze how it is that in moments, distribution and consumption might determine production. Well, quite simply, we're talking here about production as the moment. We're not talking about production as a totality. We're talking about production as a moment within that totality. And thus you can have um, uh, surges in demand that uh, cause production to go up. You can cause uh, uh, mistakes and uh, distribu distributive problems that might cause production to go down. And thus, yeah, these other sectors might influence, but they're not influencing production, the mode of production as a totality. They're influencing production as a moment within that totality. So if you recall, I mentioned that these last two rules are the dialectical part okay so what is then the dialectic present in rule number three well we already saw that with the relationship of production and consumption and and production and the other parts overall the relationship between the moments are relationships which are dialectical they adhere to one of the laws of the dialectic which is um the the interpenetration of opposites and the relationships between opposites um but what else? Well, we see here in what is mentioned as the distinction between uh, production as a totality and production as a moment, the other law of the dialectic. 
which is the law of quantity and quality, which states that a given quality has uh, within it internalized quantitative change. And that quantitative change accumulates to a certain point where it bursts. And that burst causes a qualitative change, a new form of life, a new totality. And thus, what are these moments that Marx is mentioning? We, uh, we just mentioned that production is both the totality and a moment within the totality. Well, a moment comes from the word movement. Moments are movements. They're active interactions with each other. Thus, the totality is not a circular process. Even though it might seem that way, it is a progressive process, one that moves and that is in constant movement and, and change. And thus, it is these reactions between the different parts that compose the totality that cause change and their accumulation uh, the, the accumulated change that their relations with each other cause is what allows for the possibility of the change uh, of the form of life itself, of the totality. So that's where we also see another law of the dialectics, quantity and quality. More specifically, the leap that quantity causes, which brings about qualitative change. And then when that qualitative change is, when it comes into being, it also reestablishes a quantitative relationship of change within itself as a new totality. Alrighty, and now we've made it to our last rule, rule number four, and it states treat a concrete form of life as contradictory. So this rule is grounded on the principle of growth. She states growth is different from action and self-movement. Growth is development that is transcendence, a going beyond what is, a becoming more than or other than what is. Growth for a subjectivity is learning. The resolution of a contradiction is a learning. And thus, what we have here is a process of learning that provides for its own growth, its own supersession. She states, a concrete form of life treats phenomena as discrete things that are related to other things. This contrasts with an analytic form of life which treats phenomena as grounded objects, internal relations of a totality. A concrete form of life does not know grounds. It does not know subjectivity. To be a form of life however, is to have grounds. A form of life that, forget, that forgets grounds denies itself as such. It is self-contradictory. Concrete theorizing is a display of unselfconscious theorizing, while analytic theorizing is a display of self-conscious theorizing. Thus, the possibility for the form of life of the analytic, which can be described as the non-extranged form of life, right, the non-contradictory form of life um, is one that understands its possibility as a negation of the concrete form of life. So its possibility is one that's based on overcoming the repression that is presently at play in the concrete form of life. So Marx grounds the repression itself in the contradiction. She states that an analytic form of life is a production that remembers its grounds, an internal relation of production to grounds. So uh, if we want to use the jargon that Marx used in, in the manuscripts of 44, it is a non-alienated form of life, a form of life that is not guided by the separation of the laborer from his product, from the process of production, from man and from species, right? It is a, a form of life that is de-fetishized, that sees things not as the results of their own interactions as separified, reified things, but that sees things as objectified labor, as the results of human interactions, uh, and interactions specifically that are laborious interactions. So with this process, which uh, is essentially what socialism is conceived of, this process, which is a process of defetitization, de-alienation, um, is what she is describing as the analytic form of life. 
Um, it is a form of life where the object is not divorced from its purpose, where the purpose of production is not divorced from the object of production. The unity of purpose and object are both realized in, in labor. Um, so it is in this, in essence, what we have is that in the analytic form of life, the intentional production of meaningful objects. And thus, what she's positing as the analytic form of life here is, as I mentioned, essentially what is conceived of as that materially qualitative leap towards socialism. The riddle of capitalism, then, is exposed in the concrete form of life. It is riddled with contradictions and separations and all of these characteristics that we've mentioned are attributed to the concrete form of life, or at least what she calls the concrete form of life. So what is the subject object for capitalism then? Because in the subject object, we find the pith of the contradictions because that's where the productive level is at. Well, the subject object is uh, capital in, in the form of, of the commodity. Why? Because it is a contradictory object. It is a dual object, an object that is both A and not A, right? And what does this mean? Well, that it is an object that on one end, it's exchange value, right? Which is a value that refers to the object's abstract exchangeability with other objects. And then it's use value, which is related to um, the concrete usefulness of the object. And although the exchange value depends on there being a use value, it acts as if the use value is irrelevant. And it is, in, in a sense, irrelevant in calculating the exchange value. Thus, in the commodity, we find a contradiction present in the exchange value, a value that presupposes a use value, but which, in its abstract formulation, acts as if it doesn't exist. And thus, uh, Boulot states, it is self-contradictory because it presupposes on the one side that which it excludes on the other. Uh, we have an exchange value that is measured by what? Well, even the fact that it's measured is, is, a, is a statement about its, uh, its condition. It is uh, quantifiable value. It is value that is quantifiable, a value that you can measure, right? And in its highest formulation, it is uh, measurable through the universal commodity uh, uh, of money, right? And that's what chapter one of, of Capital Volume One deals with. Um, but use value is not measurable in the same way. You can't quantify use value. Use value is experienced completely different. So you have a deep antagonism, a deep contradiction present at the core of the subject object of capitalism. And that is the contradiction between exchange and use values and everything else that entails However, as she states, as capital, exchange value and use value remain united in the commodity form. In simple circulation, exchange value and use value are separated, taking the form of money or a specific commodity, but never both in the same form. In its money form, it loses its quality as value when it, ex when it exchanges for a commodity which it consumes. In its form as capital, it does not lose its quality as value when it consumes a commodity. Capital is the unity of commodity and money. And thus, Marx states in page 266, 266 of the Grandrice that exchange value posited as the unity of commodity and money is capital. And this positing itself appears as the circulation of capital. Thus, she states that Marx develops the contradictory relation of capital and labor, in which capital presupposes labor as use value, the production of value, while it treats labor exclusively as exchange value, a cost of production. The accumulation of capital requires contradictory conditions. It requires suspending its conditions of reproduction, labor as use values, in order to realize its purpose, increase in exchange value. Therefore, it cannot see itself as a totality. It must forget one side. When remembering one relation, it must forget the other. And this contradiction in the commodity form 
is not just something that's that's in our mind. It's not uh, a distinction uh, between use and exchange value that we can explain to be superfluous and say that they're both the same thing, that the exchange value is the use value. Because then one states, well, what what's the need for, for both concepts? And the thing is that the need for both concepts uh, stem from concrete reality. The way they're treated in real life uh, is what allows for the conceptualization of them as, as separated. And the thing is that understanding them as separated is what allows us to understand the fluctuations then in price. Because you can have, for example, um, an exchange value that remains the same and then a use value that increases or decreases or a use value that decreases or increases and an exchange value that remains the same. So the fluctuations or lack of fluctuations in price and then fluctuations in use um, help us, uh, are only understandable within this framework of the contradictory essence of the commodity form. As opposed to this, socialism or an analytic form of life, whatever you want to call it, is the opposite. She states, in a self-conscious form of life, the subject, encapsulating purpose, and the object, the realization of that purpose, together would constitute an identity, aspects of a unity. In the commodity form as capital, the aim is the production of exchange value, wealth, and the means is the production of use values. Exchange value and its agents do not recognize use value and its agents as identical with itself as being different aspects of a unity. Because the difference between them is not an ideal difference. It is not a difference in ideas. It is a, a concrete difference. This contradiction is thus something that even if you're conscious of it, you can't solve in your mind. And here's the, the difference between the idealist dialecticians who think that if you can think it, it, <laughs> it becomes true. Um, uh, that, that the real world is an abstraction of thought. No, um, uh, thought is uh, grounded in, in materiality. And thus, you can't fix the, the contradiction at play in, in the commodity form, in capital. You can't fix that contradiction in your head. You can't. It's something that has to be fixed in practice. And then only once it's fixed in practice can you conceive of it in your head as fixed. Thus, what we see in capital's relationship to labor is the fundamental contradiction uh, in capitalism, at least at the humanistic level, because capital presupposes labor for use value in order to increase the exchange value of its commodities, but it is forced to treat labor as exchange value, and in doing so, not recognize it as use value. Why? Because, well, if capital recognizes labor as use value, then the value that labor adds to the capital that's there, it's forced to be given to the labor as such. So what the commodity is exchanged for, that value added has to be given to the labor if the labor is interpreted, is if, if labor is conceived of as use value. But labor has to be conceived of as exchange value in order for profit to arise, in order for that accumulation of capital to become possible. So there has to be a difference between the exchange value that is attributed to the laborer and the exchange value in the product of the laborer's labor. And in that difference, that what you have, of course, is, is surplus value, surplus labor, unpaid labor, exploitation, um, and, and the whole shebang. Um, so. What you have at the core of capitalism, what you have at the core of the form of life, uh, of capitalism, of this present totality, is a contradiction which, uh, where it justifies its own existence on terms of freedom, on terms of equality among exchangers, um, but yet the reality is one that is based on theft, on exploitation, on oppression, on violence, and on everything else. And thus, we have, uh, I present the example in my last video, which is a reading of an essay uh, criticizing the concept of justice in Western political philosophy. We have what I call 
the Holy Father in, in the covenant, right? Uh, Thomas Hobbes' conception that the basis of civilization is the covenant, the keeping of covenants, and that's what the state is there to do, is there to keep covenants because that's what uh, justice is. That's what's the good. Um, so you have at the foundation of, of this form of life a conception of uh, free, free relations between people. Um, and in reality, what you have is the, the reducing of a, a majority group of people to thingness in order to treat them uh, as merely exchange value. Uh, because their use value is uh, is the source of of profit of the increase in value of of capital, um, and thus what we have here is a concrete reality. It's not something you can solve in your mind. You have a a material relationship which entails uh, class struggle and the struggle of labor to realize itself as use value against the struggle of capital to realize itself as exchange value. This conflict is internal to the production of capital. It provides for learning and growth, the development of self-conscious and a socialized proletariat. So it is this development, this condition, this contradiction, which allows for the negation to exist, for the negation to become a possibility, or the negation better yet stated as socialism. Alrighty, folks. Well, that's that's all. Uh, that'll be all for today's part one of Rosslyn Wallach Bellows' uh, dialectical phenomenology, the method of Marx. I apologize if I'm pronouncing the name incorrectly, which I'm pretty sure I probably am, but I couldn't find proper pronunciation online. So, um, <laughs> what I what I think it is 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 probably going to have to do. But um, there's a, a Sticking with the theme of the last two rules is an interesting dialectic that is at play in making these videos where um, one has to deal with either the instinct of going quite in depth and, and really touching on basically all of the arguments being made in the book and expanding on them and then the the sort of practicality of just sticking to the main arguments and, and having perhaps a shorter video. Um, I think I probably let my, my instinct to go for a longer video um, a little a little bit too loose uh, today. So I'm hoping for the next three parts to perhaps be a little shorter. I'm going to try to keep them below an hour. I imagine that's probably a lot easier to, to finish um, than a, a two hour and something long uh, basically podcast because there's not really uh, videos attached it's just pictures but I, I do hope to make the next three videos a bit more entertaining but overall I, I, I do think that if if you're able to make it this far um, you got uh, quite valuable valuable content um, out of out of it I, I think it's a it's a valuable text to read and a, and a quite unique interpretation of the method of Marx there's a few things that I stated along the road that I disagree with and um, perhaps I do a video when I'm done um, with the series on, on some of the comments that I, I, I would attack or, or, or argue against. But overall, I do recommend um, anyone who's interested in Marxism to, to grab this text um, or just overall grab the Grand Trees. It's a phenomenal text. It's a pretty gruesome read but it's it's worth it and at the end of it you have a, a fuzzy feeling of having accomplished something that was quite hard to do from the start so um, this was supposed to be an outro and in the outro itself I'm, I'm talking probably way too much but thank you and if you enjoyed it please drop a like comment uh, and uh, share it if you, if you want to share it and, and subscribe if you want to um, it's going to be a four-part series, so if you listen to this one, I recommend you listen to the other three that are upcoming, and I'm going to try to do upload one each week, even though I'll probably record all of, uh, all of the other ones uh, in the upcoming days. I'm going to try to space them out uh, weekly so that there's, uh, 
there's a good consistency, a weekly consistency with, with the videos on the page. But uh, thank you and have a good day.